Bishop kindly come and take us deeper into the place of grace because we want to know, we want Amen. to understand this better. Welcome, my Bishop. Hallelujah. We, we thank God for his grace that has been so sufficient to us. And we are here because of him. It's not about us. It is about him. Amen. This week, we are starting the second week of prayer. Remember, we have three areas we normally major on. Your life and family. Then you come to the church. And then you go to the nation. I would like you to remember this church better and deeper this particular second week. And it is easy for you to remember how to go about it in your prayers. Kindly take one letter called I. I love that letter sometimes. I. I number one for intimacy. Let's have a time to pray that the church members of Genelim you can also extend to the body of Christ that they may have intimate relationship with God. That Christians may deepen their roots in faith. I want you to pray for intimacy, including yourself, your family members, and every other person who is with you. Can you pray that intimacy may be a real thing concerning our lives? When you do that, you find the church as people are coming, as people are getting under this umbrella, they shall have a closer relationship with the God. We want to avoid the situation of people called Christians, yet they have no joy, they have no connection with the owner of this religion, and that is Jesus Christ. Number two, the letter I for influence. It is good to seek God that whatever you gain from God will influence the heathens, the non-believers, that they may love this Jesus. So remember influence. Pray that even the leaders of this church, God will grant them influence. Wherever we need to move, whatever we need to do the work of the ministry, we shall have influence. Pray that even your own children will be influential not for any boasting, but for the sake of Christ. I want you to believe any friends will be your portion. That even your child in class will influence other children to know Jesus. Can I hear any friends? I number three is the eye of increase. I've said number one, intimacy. Letter two, or I two, is influence, I three is increase. I believe in God of increase. God is a God of multiplication. God is a God of plus. I want you to believe that there shall be increase in your family. There shall be increase of love, increase of peace. There shall be increase in whatever the family does. Talk of business, talk of work. We want to declare even incremental in, in, in things to do with the salaries. We want to believe there shall be increase. When we come to church, we see increase. Let us believe God for increase in numbers. We want membership to increase. Do you know when church members increase, did you know that means heaven is getting populated? Did you know when people come to church and we direct them to Christ, we are making heaven to increase. Are you getting that? So we desire increase. People getting saved. People coming to Jesus from all areas. We also believe in increase because we need facilities. We need finances. We need to excel. We need to do much. And like now this church with a project of buying a big lot. I want you to believe it. I want you to say increase even in resources. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we say those eyes again? I number one. Intimacy. I number two. Influence. I number three. Can you give a clap to Jesus? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the moment that you've granted us to share your word. We appreciate one another because it is through the grace of God 
that you have given us this fellowship. Lord, we honor you. We worship you. And God, as I take your people through the scriptures, Lord Almighty, I rise above every experience and I declare Jehovah, it shall be under the influence and the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I pray that your word will make us all you want us to be. I speak transformation. I speak growth and development in the name of Jesus Christ. May your word do its purpose as you have sent it, oh God. Let your word come even to do all that which you have purposed in our personal lives, in our corporate fellowship, in our families. God, in the mighty name of Jesus, in this dispensation of the grace of God, Father, I believe we shall be according to your will. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I allow you to sit in the interest of time. And the Lord bless you so much. Our topic today is the sign of his goodness. The sign of his goodness. Psalms 86 verse 17. The sign of his goodness. Give us Psalms 86 and verse number 17. I want us to read that verse and we flow together. Wonderful, wonderful. I think there is something good when people are praying and trusting God and genuinely seeking God. There is an open heaven. That's something I am feeling. We need to continue holding on to that grace of prayer because things are opening up, including in your life and the life of the church. Psalms 6 verse number 17. This one we are going to look at it from different versions. This one is version of a New King James Version. The Bible says, show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you Lord have helped me and comforted me. I don't know where the studio you may have NIV. Or another version I want us to say. Yes. Give me a sign of your goodness. That my enemies may see it. And be put to shame. For you O oh Lord. Have helped me. And comforted me. We've continued to share about the grace of God. And I want you to see. When you look at the verse here that the sign of your goodness, the sign of your goodness, this is David speaking to Jehovah, this goodness, I've looked at it widely, only to discover it is carrying all. Again, it is carrying grace, it's carrying masses, it's carrying favor, it's carrying the glory of God. When you see goodness, if somebody is called good, it is a summary point of how the person is. That person is generous. That person is obedient. That person is happy. That person can associate with people when you hear good. And that's why when David is saying, is saying that give me, show me a sign of your goodness. Now in the combination of goodness, there are two things you find, and we have been mentioning them, uh, grace and mercy. I say this month, our work is to expound, is to continue checking, studying the word, until we understand where we belong. And you find the word goodness carrying grace. What is grace and mercy? When you look at them, I'm saying it now in another version. When you see mercy, that is God's decision not to punish us. Mercy is God's decision not to punish us. When you see grace, it is God's decision uh, to save and bless us. Now, if you look at mercy, it means you are already maybe convicted, uh, judged, and condemned. You are already sentenced to die. But somebody has mercy on you. 
So you find mercy is that decision of God not to punish you. When you look at grace, now after you have mercy, you are not punished, you are not condemned, you need now to be, you know, to remain in the circle of salvation whereby the decision of God is to save you and to bless you. I want to say the sign of his goodness is a token, is a deposit, is like a down payment. It is a sign showing that this is where I belong. I like when Pastor Lucas says a grace is a location, is a place. You find it's like a sign, a token, it is a signal to show that this is where I belong. I belong to the goodness of the Lord. And David is asking, just give me, show me a sign of your goodness. Many theologians have tried to look at this goodness or this sign. What is the sign? You are coming to see from the scriptures if you study that it's mainly the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. A given in the midst of trials, in the midst of confusion, and it is confirmed by the presence of God. I repeat, the sign of God's goodness, the sign of grace, the sign of mercy is actually the peace, peace that you experience, peace that surpasses your understanding and it is given in the midst of trouble. You, you, you imagine when everything is in confusion, in chaos and nobody is peaceful but somebody is there and has peace. When we were doing our Bible exam, we found in the book of Acts chapter 12, you saw the man we call Simon Peter. How settled he was. He was in jail, guarded by 16 soldiers or guards. And then he can afford to sleep. I like that. Acts chapter 12 verse 6. He could manage to sleep. How many of us can fight sleep surrounded by soldiers who are meant to harm you in case you joke around and expecting tomorrow that Herod will announce your assassination because that was the thread you can see peace but that's a sign when you find it it is there you find God's grace I want you to see when we continue, let's continue looking at it so that you understand better. First Samuel chapter 19. Let's see this David. This is David. He is saying, when you show me the sign, one thing I'm certain is that my enemies will see it and I'll be ashamed. Take us to First Samuel chapter 19. You know Christians, many Christians are very happy when they are mentioning enemies. When they are saying yes, God come through for me so that my enemies may see it. I think we live in the middle of enemies, isn't it? But keep, keep, keep your wisdom. Get to know who is an enemy and who could be your destiny helper. They may come so negative but they could be the ones to help you in your destiny. Hallelujah. When you grow in grace you discover like Jesus who could not afford to open his mouth and call Judas his enemy. He was calling him, my friend, do what you're doing. Because, okay, look at David. I want you to look at David in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. That verse alone, even if you don't read others, I want you to discover grace for David. The goodness, the sign that I, David, have been anointed. Saul wants to kill me, but I have to see my palace. I must get to the throne. That's a sign. Which sign? When you look at this man, Saul, 
he speaks to Jonathan, his son, and all his servants that they should, mark the word should, kill David. So they are permitted to kill. They are told this young man should be in the grave. We should not see him again. It was decided. And who is saying this? This is the president of the land. Let's call him that. The key. Who can spare you from that? None. If the king has said it, that you die, you can die. But look at this. Jonathan Saul's son delighted greatly in David. Let's move to the other verse. Let's continue. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. When you find somebody who belongs to your killer, belongs to the house of your murderer, and is the one leaking information and telling you how safe you should keep yourself, revealing all the secrets of the murderer, that's a sign of God's goodness. Because if David missed that sign, in other words, Jonathan was the sign in that family. And that sign was in the covenant. Because David and Jonathan were friends. They were covenant friends. But I want you to discover the grace of God, the goodness of God. Show me a sign of your goodness. You, need, you, you don't know here that it was not easy for David this time. Why? If David was one of the sons of King Saul, anointed to reign after him, Saul would be okay. And today, my dear ones, we have the same experiences. Did you know there are some bosses that are heading departments and offices? Once they think about their sons and daughters, that they never did well in school, they can't afford to come to an office like this one. He is seeing you there with your papers. And you are doing well. But there is a certain jealousy that comes. This one should not be the one here. My son should be the one. Are you getting this? And we are experiencing these things in the society. Somebody feeling, oh no. I wish it is my son, it is my daughter owning that vehicle. Why should it be so and so? It is even extending to families as far as marriages is concerned. I thought my daughter would be married by a richer man than this one. That's a parent who is even throwing arrows in that particular marriage. We have seen it. I wish my son married so and so. Why this one from a poor family? I want to declare to somebody here. We are talking of the grace of God. And jealousy must be destroyed. We must hold on to the sign of the goodness of the Lord. It is not about him or her. It is about God who has positioned them. David found himself in love with God. It is God who said, I have found David a man after my own heart. King Saul, what is your problem? Look at it. He wants him dead. But thank God in the house of the same killer, we have Jonathan who is telling David, this is the idea that is generating from our house. But I want you in safety. May God give you a sign of his goodness. Even where you are enemies, the troops and guns are hiding against you. May there be a disclosure. Let there be a revealer of whatever is happening because there is a sign of God's goodness for you. If you look at the other verse, look at verse 3. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. 
and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Whatever I sense, whatever I detect from the killer, I will tell you. I want to declare to everybody under my voice, your enemies will not succeed to kill you. It shall be revealed to you and they shall be ashamed in the name of Jesus. You may not say amen because you are used to prophecies. But 2021, can you take it as your portion? Hallelujah. Show me a sign of your goodness. You see, Jonathan says, I will tell you. Verse number four. Let's, let's move. I keep telling you, please, if you are in this church, you have no choice but to love the Bible. You have to love it. You have to read it. You have to go to the word. Verse four. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, look at this. Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you. And because his works have been very good toward you. Look at that. David has been so good to you. Actually, he can remind the father. Don't you remember? Even when you go crazy. This is the boy who plays the guitar and uh, the instrument. And you cool down. David has been so good to you. Why should you think of this? Verse number five. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it, Dad, and you rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? This is Jonathan speaking. He is speaking to his father Saul about David. Now look at this. When David brought victory to Israel, this man Saul took it personal. David was bringing victory for the whole country. But what happened is, when the women started dancing, you know what the dance was? That Saul has killed a thousand, but David has killed ten thousand. You see the spirit of jealousy? Now, let me ask you, if you are a father, you have killed 1,000 enemies, and your own son kills 10,000, will you be happy or not happy? You'll be happy. But because it is not his own son, that's why Saul is misbehaving. But I thank God. Let's close verse 6 and 7. Let's see verse 6 and 7. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Do you see mercy? Do you see grace? Look at verse 7. Then Jonathan called David. And Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was in his presence. As in times past. Now reaching there. Though the battle will come again. Do you see the grace? Do you see the sign of goodness? The sign is not in the field. The sign is in the house. Of King Saul. The house of the killer. And I want you to see. When David came back. It is said that David. Was a good man. He was doing right. But let's go again to 1 Samuel 24. Now let's see how things will be. But what has Saul said? He shall not die. He shall not be killed. I wanted you to see, even before we touched 24, when King Saul says, he shall not die, it is prophetic. It is important to know that Paul, uh, Saul, I mean Saul, King Saul is speaking and expressing now a different idea from the original one. A God is able to change when the grace of God is upon you, David. God is able to change the jealous heart of Saul to turn the words, having spoken.
spoken, you be killed, and now speaking that you live. And from there, even all the other battles that will come, they will not manage to kill David. Let's see now. Verse 6 of, let, take us to 24 verse 4. First Samuel chapter 24 and verse 4. My Bible says something here that then the men of David say to him, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your heart that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now pause there. I want to give you a scenario that developed later. King Saul is not stopping. He is still feeling, no, this boy should die. David has not done anything wrong. That's what I want you to understand. So that you fight as grace and mercy are upon your life. You will fight and enmity may arise against you. But because God is still with you and the grace of God, the sign of his goodness is still in place, you fight your safety and security. Look at this. These men are walking with the David. Remember he had 600 men. These are the men he transformed. When he ran away the first time from King Saul and went to stay in the cave of Adullam. He stayed there and they started coming with all their problems, with all their miseries, with all their disappointments, with all their debts, and he transformed them. Because David has the grace to do that. After transforming them, they became a mighty army. So they are with him now. They are encouraging David. But one time as Saul was chasing after David, he came to the cave. David was on the other side. And the man told David, now God has brought him where we are. The enemy is here, King David. Your time has come for you to kill your enemy. But you remember David used to say, no, I'm anointed, yes. But he is also the anointed of God. I cannot touch the anointed. What David managed to do is to cut a piece of the cloth of Saul. I'm giving this story with a definition. And I want you to see it clearly here. That when he cut... David did not find peace. The heart was troubled. They are telling him, kill Saul. He has only managed to cut the piece of the cloth. And he is peaceless. Can I tell you? The greatest peace is not in you killing your enemy. Your peace is not found by fighting them finished. Especially the enemies in the form of a human being. I want you to differentiate that. If you talk of devils, we must destroy them. But if it is a human being, oh hallelujah. When David says, you have laid a table, even in the presence of my enemies. I want you to understand that your victory is not measured by how your critics your opponent are finished. No. Actually your victory, your success is better measured when God raises you and your enemies are watching. They are also surviving. And more so, they start benefiting from your success. That's when you can say I've conquered. I have victory. Church, Christians, let's avoid this spirit of competition, this spirit of jealousy. Let's say, God, in your grace, I will excel. Hallelujah. I will do all things. Look at David. After that, he had an opportunity to kill Saul, but he is cutting the robe. By that, it means, listen to me. You may be happy when you uncover your enemy. For people to see, look at him. He is the one who has been, you know, harassing me around. But that small piece of cloth he cut and gave him no peace. It was a sign of uncovering the king of the Lord. 
Yes, the king is the killer. But I have uncovered him. Even if it's only a part of the leg that I have uncovered. I'm not supposed to do so. Now look at this. Let's take to the other verse. Let's take it. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's anointed to, to stretch out my heart. The, Lord, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him. Seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Verse 7. Let's move faster. And so David restrained his servant with these words. And did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Lakini Goja. Give us verse 8. David also arose afterward, went out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, My Lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. To do what? Verse number 9. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm? Verse 10. Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eyes spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out your, my hand against you, my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Let's, let's look at it from verse 16. Give us verse 16 now. Jump to verse 16. So it was after David finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, now this is where we are. Is this your voice, my son, David? What has Saul said? Is this your voice, my son, David? Now, the heart of King Saul is revealing everything. When you see my son, David, look at it keenly scripturally you see the reason why he was doing what he was doing against David it was it is because it was not registered in his heart that David was his son but now that David has done good this is what he says is this your voice my son David my goodness I declare in the name of Jesus may we be allowed and accepted even to dwell where our opposition did not want us to dwell. I declare in the name of Jesus, the anointing and the grace of God, the sign of God's goodness to be upon you, that even your enemy will see it and spare you. Why? Look at it. He so lifted up his voice and wept. The heart of a murderer is weeping now because the subject because the victim the one who was to die is still walking under the goodness of the Lord under the grace of God and he is ready to do good to all verse number 17 says something then he said to David you are more righteous than I I like that mm, let it be known May our enemies, may them that thought we should not live, let them look at us, let them be shown the sign, and they see, hey, it's not what I thought. I thought he should die, but he is better than me. I better die and he lives. This is God's work. You may look at it from the Bible, but I want to tell you before the year 2021, somebody will come with a testimony that for sure it was meant for my head but the goodness of the Lord was upon me when I was praying this week something came to my heart so heavily yes we are talking of the grace of God the year of recovery many people are talking of the year even of rising high but there is going to be a season that you need to wait upon God. That you need to hold on to the grace. The time of need. I want to speak prophetically to your life. May that season of need. That season that you feel you need God. 
May the sign of his goodness be your star in Jesus' name. Now, look at this. We are, we are not yet through with the soul. I want you to see it. For you have rewarded me with the good. That's what Saul is saying. You have rewarded me with the good. Whereas, I have rewarded you with the evil. When the goodness of the Lord is with you, you spread it. David is having that goodness of the Lord. He is spreading it even to his enemy, if I may say so. And verse 18, let's move together. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your heart, you did not kill me. So Saul is trying to compare. If it is David who came next to me, I would have killed him. But now I went to where he is and he did not kill me. Verse number 19. If a man fights his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Can you answer me also, church? When a man fights his enemy who has terrorized you, would you and especially if it is not within the dispensation of grace, especially in the Old Testament, what do you think they were doing? An enemy comes your way. Oh, you kill. But what happens? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with the good. Somebody say good. May the Lord reward you with the good for what you have done to me this day. Though Saul is an enemy, he is still anointed and he is now forced to speak prophetically over the life of, King, of, of David. And God is able to do that. Even to turn the old men of the village who thought you are crazy for getting saved. And now they call you and say, you are blessed. We bless you. This one is saying, and now I know indeed that you shall surely be king. And that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. This is King Saul. He has been given a chance, a slim chance, to hand over officially. He's actually handing over. He may not know, but the sign of the Lord's goodness upon David is forcing things to move and to turn around. He says, and I know indeed that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your heart. I declare that voice to come out of every corner, even where your enemies were hiding. Let them be forced to speak of your goodness. Let them prophetically send you to your destiny. Let them speak even if they are not aware of what they are saying. The year 2021, the year of grace manifestation, we shall not be allowed even to see our enemies dropping over us and even threatening of our life, we declare in the name of Jesus, they shall be commanded uh, to speak our destiny. When you close with verse 21 and 22, 21, give us 21. Therefore swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. King Saul is pleading with David because he can see where David is going. He can declare very clearly that David you shall be the king. You will establish the kingdom of Israel. In other words, the mess I have done in this country. You are the one to come and rectify. Israel will be established in your hands but spare me. Spare my name. Spare my people. Verse 22. He says, So David swore to Saul, and Saul went home. But David and his men went back to the stronghold. Now, when we are looking at this, the sign of his goodness, my brethren, where are we? Where is your life today? My appeal is that we do one thing that is so much in my heart. We need to lift our lives to God. 
we need to release people. I have a feeling that if today this sign will make your enemies ashamed, you cannot take it the way you are. You must surrender to God. You must subject yourself to that goodness. And you must avoid jealousy. You must avoid hatred. You must avoid all manner of unforgiveness. The goodness of the Lord cannot penetrate to your life if you have a cover of unforgiveness, a cover of jealousy, a cover of evil. And the word of God is very clear. Show me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be ashamed. God is a party to the person who walks according to his word. They hold hands together to ashamed the enemies. I want to say it again. If your heart is heavy, carrying someone, carrying someone in mind, thinking about all oh, what they said and did about you, I want you to be a free man, a free woman, to enjoy the grace of God, to enjoy the goodness of the Lord. For in that heaviness, there is no penetration of his goodness. Anytime you hold a grudge, you are holding one of the pillars in the kingdom of the enemy. And so you are right there. But the moment you forgive, the moment you release them, they may be your relatives. They may be the people you have worked with. They may be your leaders in your company. They may be your sons or your daughters. I want to declare in the name of Jesus. If the sign of his goodness is going to operate for us and against our enemies, there must be clarity of your spirit. And I don't need to go beyond there. Stand up, we pray. Let's pray over that. Let's pray. Let, let's, let's get to the spirit of God. Just take a few minutes before I invite the pastor to take us to the offertory. I want you to say a prayer in your heart in the name of Jesus. Sometimes we are carried away by life and the activities and we tend to forget what is ailing us. I'm saying King David is here. He is anointed already. But the office is not vacant. And the occupier of the office does not want to allow him to enjoy that destiny. But what is David doing? Uh, David has a clean heart. In fact, David has prayed somewhere and said, Give me an undivided heart. Give me an undivided heart. That I may see the goodness of the Lord. May I tell you, my brother, my sister, you need that whole heart. People of God, what is this that is tying us? That you can remember what they did to you 20 years ago. And it is still making you sick. What is this that is bothering you? If you have God with you, the Bible says if God is on our side, who can manage to be against us? Somebody release your heart to God. Let every heaviness break down. Let every weight melt. Let your heart be free. Oh yes, you should not talk of them. Uh, talk of your God now. It is God who gives you the sign of goodness. You can see you are still alive. You are still walking. You are managing to eat and drink. You are managing to have a shelter. Yet they thought you would be dead. Leave them alone and walk with the goodness of God. Somebody open your heart as you pray. I sincerely release from my heart everything, every weight. I release every nonsense of jealousy, envy, and all manner of unforgiveness in the name of Jesus. 
a church of Jesus Christ I want you to be free it is time to be free it is time to be free that you enjoy and the goodness of the Lord and the grace of God the masses of God yes God is releasing his grace the grace must penetrate but remove every cover of heaviness let every weight be thrown off in the name of Jesus my God I thank you today Lord Jehovah I appreciate you I give you all the glory today I honor you my father my redeemer and my God Oh, let it break, let it break, let it break, let every heaviness break and from the hearts of my sisters, from the hearts of my brothers, my God, from the hearts of your people in the house of God, in the name of Jesus, my Lord and my Father, even them that are unable to forgive themselves, Father, enable them to release themselves. Uh, to the power of your grace in the mighty name of Jesus in the name of Jesus oh hallelujah father we thank you and we exhort you somebody lift up your hands again I want us to be sincere before the Lord because his grace remains sufficient even as we share this it is becoming so personal that you must be yourself and God. You must align yourself with the God. You may have failed even to forgive yourself because in one way or the other you let yourself down and you let God down. I want you to know there is the mercy of God. God is so merciful. God is so gracious. He has been identified as the God of all grace. I want you to hold on to him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You may be dealing with a situation where you are talking of people who have created a wall of enmity against you. And you can identify it very clearly. I want you to point at that point and declare the goodness of the Lord. Because after this, somebody will emerge with a testimony that I no longer feel anything about their threat for the Lord is with me. And they shall see you thriving and going up in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for everyone under my voice. I pray God that you help us. Lead us, Jehovah, direct our steps in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I oh, declare right now that every heaviness, every canopy of jealousy, every canopy of rejection, every canopy of evil over any one of us is broken right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And we declare we are free. We announce liberty. We announce freedom. And the joy of the Lord is restored in our lives. Father, I thank you so much because of your word. And even as I lead your people to celebrate this grace. Every time we gather in this month. I pray Heavenly Father, open their understanding, open their hearts and their spirit. And above all, may the grace of God remain sufficient to all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give a mighty clap to Jesus. As I invite Pastor Lucas to take us to offertory or whoever is on duty listen to this with God's grace we have an endless hope but without God's grace we have a hopeless end it's a statement I got from Rick Warren a writer of books he says with God's grace 
we have an endless hope. Without his grace, we have a hopeless end. You can see that with King David. I enjoy it. That all what Saul said, that you be the king, Israel will be established in your hands. Even after that, God said, I will not remove the lampstand from David's house, but he had removed from King Saul's house. I speak prophetically now. Let's love to walk in the grace of God. God bless you.